Okay, lovely. So yeah, welcome everyone to the fourth the panel on performativity. I'm really excited to introduce the three speakers that we have this afternoon. Um, the first speaker is Colleen Hill, um, who is the curator of costume and accessories at the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Uh, she is also currently a PhD student at London College of Fashion and she is going to be speaking on fill in the blank masking at Maison Martin Margiela. So Colleen, if you can take over. Hey, nice Hi. to see you, Colleen. Nice well. to see you too. Hello. I was hoping that was you. <laughs> and I'll set a timer and um, remind you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to jump right in. In 2013 and 2014, rapper Kanye West toured the United States, Canada, and Australia. Although West had firmly established his influence on the music industry, the impact he would make on the fashion world was burgeoning. It was quickly enhanced by his choice of tour attire, a wardrobe by Maison Martin Margiela. Many of West's fans would have already associated him with Margiela. Two years earlier, he had mentioned the label in a song he recorded with Jay-Z. West's tour wardrobe included 10 couture garments, 20 ready-to-wear looks, custom sneakers, and a group of striking embellished masks that entirely concealed the musician's face. The masks worn by West were similar to gem-encrusted styles shown in Maison Martin Margiela's Fall 2012 collection. An important question arose, how could anyone see in the masks? A representative from the label explained that the base of each style was made from semi-transparent black silk gauze and that the embellishments were carefully arranged so that the wearer could see around them. Each mask took 18 hours to make, including the final design, fitting, and assembly. West's adoption of the Margiela masks undoubtedly helped to cement the label's legacy in popular culture. This photograph demonstrates that West's onstage performers were likewise costumed in masks, yet their spare styles were made from what appears to be stretchy camel-hued fabric, presumably left unembellished to emphasize West's status as the headlining performer. What is intriguing for the topic of this talk is how closely these masked performers resembled the models in some of Margiela's earliest runway shows. When writing about West, however, the press generally referenced the history of masking at Maison Margiela only in passing, if at all. Belgian-born Margiela founded his fashion house with business partner Jenny Marins in 1988. He showed his first collection the following year and presented a total of 41 collections before resigning from his namesake label. Many listeners may be familiar with Margiela's avoidance of the spotlight, but the particularities of this evasion are worth a brief overview here. From the inception of his label, Margiela cultivated anonymity. He refused interviews, famously communicating with the press only through facts, and even then only vaguely, and resisted being photographed. This image was published in the 1994 article in Women's Wear Daily, in which the writer made mention of the designer's reluctance to be in the spotlight. Margiela had insisted that the photographer focus on the models rather than him. The 2019 documentary Marta Margiela, in his own words, notif mo notably focused on Margiela's hands rather than his face. In the film, the designer stated, quote, it balances me that I am able to be like everybody else, end quote. The concealment of identity was clearly important to Margiela. The concept extended to a literal masking of models on the runway, beginning with the designer's first collection. Margiela referred to the fabric mask as veils and explained that he used them in order to focus attention away from the model's faces, stripping them of any persona and allowing viewers to concentrate on garments rather than faces. The designer was, after all, presenting a collection of radically repurposed, dismantled, and distressed clothing, the aesthetic of which Bill Cunningham inspired Bill Cunningham to employ the term deconstructivist to describe it. This was clothing that in all of its originality and detail truly merited a closer look. This illustration provides insight into the construction of the masks, which can be difficult to interpret in photographs. They were not merely pieces of fabric that had been pulled haphazardly over the face, but were thoughtfully constructed garments that tucked under the wearer's chin and were gathered and tied at the back of the head. Early examples were without embellishment and made from dark fabrics. 
Photographs demonstrate that in the low lighting of Margiela's catwalks, the masks sometimes successfully blended into the shadows. Still, the designer's choice to use them was unusual, and I wonder if they did more to attract attention than to discourage it. Nevertheless, the idea of masking cleverly played into what curator Olivier Sayard described as Margiela's use of anonymity as a communication instrument. The masking was, at its most basic level, a tangible rejection of fashion industry norms that extended beyond design concepts. Although masks have become indelibly associated with Margiela's aesthetic, I argue that they have become such an important part of Margiela's mythology that the irregularity of their inclusion is often ignored. Veils did not show up again until the fall 1995 collection, when much to the surprise of his followers, Margiela had shifted away from his typically neutral palette to include a variety of clothing and accessories in the color fuchsia. There were masks to match. At the end of the presentation, the models discarded the masks and ran joyfully through the crowd carrying pink helium balloons. The show serves as a reminder that the seriousness of Margiela's work should not be mistaken for gloominess. Aldo Farinella, the founder and owner of Italiana Boutique, underscored that Margiela's aesthetic inspired confidence, stating, quote, he changed the lives of hundreds of people who used to feel unnoticed, ugly, and embarrassed, end quote. The coordinated head-to-toe look seemed designed to achieve another facet of Margiela's stated intention for employing masks, the creation of a blank canvas that allowed wearers to better imagine themselves in the clothes. Although the spring 1996 collection was more sober, Margiela employed a similar strategy with masks. During their first pass of the runway, which was essentially a long table, the models wore fabric veils in black and shades of gray. The mask complemented the clothing they wore, in which photographs of vintage clothing had been printed onto new garments to create a trompe l'oeil effect. During the finale, the models removed their masks for another walk down the runway. Although Margiela stated his reasons for constructing the masks, there are further interpretations. One centers on the exclusion of famous models in his shows. While Margiela had no great interest in his own fame or that of others, it was also true that he could not afford to hire well-known models, at least in his early years. Instead, he cast friends or unknown women he saw on the street. He further accentuated their anonymity by masking them. This is a compelling argument, though it is not entirely satisfying. This photograph from the spring 1993 collection features Kate Moss, who is already a rising star in the modeling industry. The show also featured Cecilia Chancellor and Emma Balfour, both of whom were established by this time. While the casting of professional models was admittedly rare for Margiela in these early collections, this runway show disproved statements about their exclusion entirely. Margiela's financial struggles were fairly well known, and he was presenting collections in a decade when famous models were commanding higher fees than ever before. Linda Evangelista fa famously stated that she wouldn't wake up for less than $10,000 a day, and runway agent Ellen Harth disclosed that many models were making $18,000 per runway sh show during the 1990s, somewhere around 30,000 US dollars or about 22,000 pounds today. Margiela paid his models in clothes and a nominal fee. Perhaps by 1993, the gift of his cutting edge creations was enough to attract the likes of Moss, Chancellor, and Balfour. As you can see from these photographs, these models did not wear masks. The previous images were taken from the spring 1993 white collection. Those images tell only half the story from Margiela from that season. In a daring move that seemed bent on frustrating fashion editors, the designer presented two spring 1993 collections at the same time in different locations, thus making it impossible to attend both. This image is from the spring 1993 black collection and it demonstrates the evolution of a masked appearance. Black bands were painted directly over the model's eyes with a wide paintbrush. This was done only once with no touch-ups to create a deliberately sketchy effect. The spring 1993 Black Collection set the stage for the barring of models' eyes in various ways over the next 15 years. The spring 1995 collection was not shown as a formal runway presentation, but was instead shown in seven boutiques around the world. The models wore metallic silver tape over their eyes. This idea, clearly not as functional as either the veils or the black makeup, 
was once again only employed at the beginning of the presentations. Margiela himself showed up at the New York presentation of the collection, which was staged in the window of the Sharavari boutique. The model stood in a semicircle at the window for about five minutes before partaking in a post-presentation reception, presumably without their tape eye masks. They were referred to by Women's Wear Daily as real women, and they included the stylish Misha Calloway, fashion editor Evian Metzner, and her mother, photographer Sheila Metzner. Only a few months later, Women's Wear Daily would report that women working in the fashion industry, who were of course some of the most ardent consumers of high fashion, were no longer responding to advertisements featuring supermodels. Margiela's decision to employ atypical models was, as usual, on the cutting edge. Models in the fall 1996 presentation were a shadow that extended over their brows and eyes, ending at their cheekbones. Fashion critic Amy Spindler described the effect as disturbing, an observation that was perhaps enhanced by the fact that the models were grinning widely and inexplicably throughout the presentation. Unsettling as this show may have been, the styling was also an artistic achievement. At first glance, it is difficult to discern if models were wearing fabric veils or makeup. Their faces were, in fact, precisely and evenly painted to create a shaded effect. By creating a look that seems destined to draw attention more than repel it, this makeup style seems counterintuitive to allowing viewers to focus on the clothes. Yet for this collection, described by numerous fashion editors as one of Margiela's most classic or wearable, it is possible that the high impact of the makeup was intentional. In addition to fabric masks, the sensor bar, also referred to as the incognito effect, has become one of the house's most memorable stylings. The spring 2008 collection represented this style in several ways, through the application of a mask over the eyes using black eyeliner and the wearing of plastic, black plastic sunglasses that mirrored the look of a sensor bar over the eyes. This look was also replicated in several garments that were made with black bands of fabric over the breasts, pelvis, and legs. These ideas were a sort of amalgamation of styling choices from previous collections. The spring 2001 presentation included sensor bars that were made from strips of plastic in black or red placed over the model's eyes. This effect, created using a brush of black ink, was frequently featured in Margiela's lookbooks as well. The sensor bars certainly relate to what Susie Menkes referred to as Margiela's rejection of the glam model, but they may have also been a bit willfully tongue in cheek. They offer a rather insufficient attempt at anonymity that relates more to tabloids than high fashion. The shadow of sunglasses was presented in the spring 2003 collection. These images show the process of tracing a pair of sunglasses onto the model's face, the outline of which was then densely filled in with black pencil. The makeup was sometimes worn with the sunglasses layered over it. The look recalls the shadow effect presented in the fall 1996 collection, as well as the trompe l'oeil motifs of vintage clothing used in the spring 1996 collection. There is another interpretation of Margiela's predilection for masking that is important to address. A male designer's desire to camouflage a woman's face has been read as a misogynistic gesture, one that is intended to erase her individuality and dignity. While this interpretation merits consideration, it is important to contemplate it in greater context. In addition to the fact that Margiela also masked male models, several of the female models who worked with Margiela have discussed his respectful treatment of them. He was also known to ask models if his clothing was comfortable during garment fittings, asking them to put their hands in the pockets, sit down, or otherwise move in the garments to ensure their ease. I will now briefly consider one last means of masking in Margiela's collections. Although the designer had used wigs in previous collections, the fall 2002 example, or sorry, fall 2000 examples featured a variety of hair pieces in the form of long, thick bangs that were created to match the model's real hair. The bangs extended over their eyes, completely concealing them. As usual, however, there was an intriguing element of inconsistency in the styling. Just one model, shown on the right in this slide, was not wearing the bangs. Was there a mistake made or were we simply meant to wonder why this look was different? Margiela's continued role as a mysterious figure, including the vagueness of his responses to the press, have often led to more questions than answers. 
what is known as the connection between Margiela's past and his interest in hair and wigs. Margiela's father was a hairdresser and his mother sold wigs in the salon after hours. As a child, Margiela had fashioned colorful wigs for his Barbie dolls that were specially dyed to match their handmade clothing. Although Margiela employed the hair as mask concept rather infrequently, it was always memorable. The spring 2004 collection featured models whose hair had been brushed forward over their faces. The styling emphasized a collection that concentrated entirely on the front half of the garments, leaving the back half exposed and incomplete. Similar to the spring 2008 garments, those that were designed with the black bars, it is clear that the masking of the models was integral to the design concept. It was not intended to direct attention toward the clothing, but rather to engage with the garments directly. The spring 2009 collection marked Margiela's 20th anniversary and his departure from the house. The presentation was staged as the greatest hits of sorts, revisiting past ideas in new ways. Every model wore a mask of some kind. Here, I will quickly scroll through some images of the looks, which range from camel-colored camel -colored face coverings and cascades of hair over the face, to draped fabric masks and hybrid examples that were made from both fabric and hair, to more wigs, including on the right, examples that were made to blend in with the jackets they were paired with. Fashion critic Sarah Moore noticed that the coats had, quote, cuts that looked like a Margiela comment on the current fad for fringing, end quote. The collection was an impressive send off for the designer who clearly recognized the tropes of his aesthetic and pushed them to their limits. I would also argue, however, that it is this striking collection that likely leads one to think Margiela used masks more frequently than he did. As we have seen, his masking was always memorable, but it was also inconsistent. The interplay between masking and unmasking in Margiela's collections took shape in myriad literal ways, but I argue that the designer's work also demonstrated a metaphorical unmasking, centered specifically on the workings of the fashion industry. He challenged what could be considered high fashion, such as blouses that had been made from plastic carrier bags. Despite his deconstructed aesthetic, Margiela's work also demonstrated his technical prowess, especially when it came to tailoring. Early designs in clear vinyl made apparent the process of construction, highlighting seams and edges with white bias tape. Margiela's collections also made philosophical statements on the fashion industry, revealing its inadequacies and prejudices. Margiela's spring and fall 1997 collections featured two that were modeled after dressmakers' dummies, calling to mind the rigid standardization of sizes and the idealized fashionable body. The fall collection fashioned the tunics into garments that looked as though they were in the process of construction. Cuts of paper used for pattern making and lengths of fabric were draped over the tunics, while prominent basting stitches were employed as a form of embellishment. This collection came at a time in which fast fashion and designer diffusion lines proliferated, and the increased accessibility of fashion created a disconnect from the processes and people that make clothing. Margiela's work served as a reminder, or perhaps even an unveiling, of these practices. When Margiela resigned from his label in 2008, he cited the rise of social media and the immediacy of fashion, which resulted in a lack of surprise or mystery as one of the primary reasons he left the industry. As the label continued without him, masks became more of a focal point. They were increasingly embellished or in the case of the fall 2013 collection, sometimes evolved into garments themselves. Marta Margiela sometimes brought surprising touches of sparkle into his work showing models in glitter body paint or making a blouse from a disco ball, for example. But the adorned masks a la Kanye West were part of Margiela without Martin. They provided a means for the label to evolve without its founder while referencing one of the most recognizable elements of its aesthetic. Now under the creative direction of John Galliano, masking at Margiela persists. It sometimes takes new forms, such as the candy colored goggles shown here, but classic fabric veiling has been employed more recently. This translucent fabric is clearly not intended to render the model incognito, but rather seems to express continued appreciation for Martin Margiela, widely considered one of the most influential fashion designers of our era. In an initial attempt to cultivate anonymity, Margiela more readily succeeded at creating an indelible image of avant-garde fashion during the late 20th century. Thank you.
Sorry, I just need to stop Thanks, sharing Colleen, my screen that was now. There we go. <laughs> and yeah, just in time, a minute to spare. So I'll cancel my timer. Thanks so much. And so Thank next, you. next we have um, apologies if my pronunciation is wrong, Kasina Guzarova um, from Russian State University for the Humanities. And she is a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies, where she leads an interdisciplinary research seminar called The Texts of Fashion and is an associate professor at the Department of Cultural Studies and Social Communication of the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Political Administration. She also teaches on the MA programme Fashion Industry Theory Practice at the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences. Um, and she will present a paper called Cracked Enamel, the Materiality of 19th Century Makeup, which will flow really nicely from what we've just heard from Colleen. So yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for the introduction uh, and a great thanks to all the organizers for putting together this magnificent event. I've been enjoying it uh, immensely. Um, as you can see from the um, title slide, my presentation will be dedicated to 19th century makeup uh, and it is both uh, very exciting and a bit frustrating to be discussing the materiality of something which we can by no means touch and hardly see uh, and uh, i'm afraid my presentation will be a bit visually boring for that reason because it features a few pictures and a lot of quotes but I do hope that these quotes will allow us to kind of touch uh, the past uh, and uh, really experience uh, the materiality of makeup as it was uh, described and imagined in the 19th century. Uh, though Instagram filters and masks nowadays quite often play with the theme of makeup imitating or enhancing its effects, Perhaps we rarely think uh, today of uh, makeup as kind of mask, unless it's a cucumber mask or such like preparation. However, in the 19th century, the situation was quite different and both everyday women's makeup, uh, which is uh, on the whole um, and quite an under-researched area because of this um, uh, ideal of the natural beauty which pervaded this era and which kind of uh, seeps into historical research. Uh, so uh, in fact women did wear makeup and it is quite often described as a mask and also stage mask, uh, makeup uh, was uh, often described as a kind of a mask. And here you see one of the additions of what I'd like to call the Bible of uh, 19th century Bible of stage makeup, uh, Friedrich uh, Altman's uh, book the Mask of the Schauspielers, uh, the mask of the actor, the actor's mask, practical introduction to the art of the stage maker. Uh, and here uh, on the right, you can see this uh, beautiful Art Nouveau, early 20th century edition, and uh, it uh, went through quite a number of editions and was extremely influential. I'm not sure about the English language context, but I can testify that in Russia, though it had never been translated into Russian, uh, every stage makeup manual actually referred to uh, Altman, so he was quite um, an uh, expert in this field, and this book really made an, an impact uh, in uh, European stage makeup of uh, the day. And obviously this title uh, sums up uh, the essence of stage profession as it was uh, understood by contemporaries, uh, and uh, it obviously makes a reference to uh, classical Greek uh, theatre. Uh, and here in another uh, very influential German development of the latter half of the 19th century, Leichner's uh, stage uh, cosmetic, which are still produced and still used both on stage and off stage. And you see here in nowadays packaging, which features this very characteristic visual uh, reference uh, to uh, ancient a classical theatrical tradition, these uh, laughing and uh, smiling uh, masks. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, visual topos uh, was very widely featured uh, in the design of early stage makeup and also in the 
um, uh, on the covers uh, or inside uh, these uh, makeup manuals. So I was unable uh, momentarily to find a picture. So I provided you with this picture. And obviously in the uh, theatrical context, uh, this reference to a mask um, was uh, uh, something, uh, was an attempt to uh, really underscore this uh, classical tradition. Uh, and it referred to this ability of, of an actor to impersonate somebody else, somebody uh, who uh, the actor or actress was not. Uh, and if on stage this was a highly laudable achievement, uh, off stage this was uh, regarded very differently, it was derided and dreaded. Uh, and here you see a quote from the uh, 18th century um, expert in uh, the pseudoscience of physiognomy, um, Antoine Joseph Pernetti, uh, his book about knowing the moral man through the knowledge of the physical man, where he refers to the color of dissimulation, to this kind of a false face, which many people try to pull over their real face. Uh, and this is the mask that the physiognomist is trying uh, to tear off uh, and to unmask the real character. This reference to color uh, may uh, seem an, a direct indication uh, referring to makeup, but perhaps it's not so, because uh, throughout uh, the, this text, uh, Pernetti um, uses this metaphor of the mask as any attempt of a person to uh, pass uh, for somebody they are not, to dissimulate the emotions they are feeling, to uh, hide some uh, negative uh, traits of their character. Uh, so it's not necessarily about makeup, uh, and it is largely metaphorical. But in the 19th century, this metaphor actually condenses and crystallizes and materializes, really condenses around women's uh, everyday makeup. Uh, and here you see a quote from the uh, late 19th century uh, source, uh, basically also French, uh, but very quickly translated into English and into other European languages. Uh, the author who herself passed under a pen name of uh, Baroness uh, Stuff. Uh, and uh, this is her bestseller, one of her bestsellers, uh, The Ladies' uh, Dressing Room, where she um, dedicates quite a few pages to uh, how women should not uh, make up their faces and uh, what a uh, contemptible thing the mask of makeup is. And here you see one of the um, uh, more memorable quotes where she argues that an enameled woman can neither smile nor cry for fear of cracking the plaster with which her skin has been covered. Her head is like china, cold and expressionless, and her complexion by daylight is livid. So we see here quite a few words referring, uh, making parallels with certain materials, with certain material uh, objects, and it is on this parallels on these comparisons or uh, similes that uh, I would like to uh, draw uh, today. Overall, uh, obviously, uh, Baroness Stuff criticizes, uh, again, the mask uh, of makeup, which prevents uh, the uh, viewer, the observer, from uh, witnessing a person's inner life, witnessing their emotions. And in this respect, uh, this earlier uh, physiognomic um, imperatives uh, can be seen as uh, direct uh, ancestors of nowadays uh, surveillance technologies and their meaning for the creation of citizenship, which has been uh, so well uh, unpacked by uh, colleagues earlier uh, today. So there is this idea that we uh, should be able to see through each other. And this is the kind of an unspoken basis for this civil uh, contract. Uh, and also this imperative uh, is actually stronger for women. They are more often the observed than the uh, observers, and they should be, uh, they should present themselves uh, as they are. And here we see Baroness Stuff addressing this mess, which prevents us from seeing what's going on. This made up face is motionless, expressionless, uh, and its very immobility is uh, described as uh, ugly. Uh, but if we look at uh, these uh, comparisons or these descriptions, enamel, 
China plaster. Uh, what is it they are referring to? First of all, they are all used to uh, emphasize the artificiality of this cosmetic face as opposed to the so-called natural face. And indeed, this opposition between uh, nature and culture, nature and artifice, uh, is extremely important for the 19th century and is emphasized uh, throughout uh, the uh, sources that uh, I'm using. But I would like to draw attention to another uh, opposition, and that is of the original and copy of a work of art and its imitation. Because indeed, all of these materials evoked here uh, can be uh, seen as belonging to the world of mass produced objects. of objects of craft rather than art. Particularly, I think the reference to plaster is telling, which is very widespread in the 19th century throughout uh, Europe in different languages. So this uh, contemptible uh, feminine makeup is compared to plaster. And the following quote uh, shows, uh, I hope, um, this uh, distinction very clearly. It comes from uh, a very uh, well-known and widely quoted uh, essay by uh, Théophile Gautier on fashion. Uh, Gautier, along with Charles Baudelaire, was one of the rare uh, champions of women's makeup who compared it to an artistic uh, practice, an artistic gesture. And here we see him uh, comparing actual makeup to a work of a painter. Uh, and then to work of a sculptor, because by whitening their skin with powder, women cause their skin to take on the mica finish of marble. And we have this opposition between a marble sculpture and its cheap and uh, its cheap imitation in plaster. And this is something that uh, seems uh, particularly important to me, and something I would like to uh, emphasize. But good and bad masks are evoked not only in the context of women's makeup, but also in the theatrical context I referred to before. Indeed, if we go back to um, uh, Friedrich Altman's book, uh, The Mask of an Actor, uh, in opposition to Die Maske, the mask that uh, appears in the title of the work and which uh, has this reference to classical um, theatrical tradition. Uh, there is also a, a Bax uh, mask for which there is a specific German uh, word. Uh, and the context briefly is the transition from oil lighting to gas lighting in theaters and the necessarily changes in makeup because from uh, liquid white as a foundation for uh, stage makeup, uh, the transition was made to uh, this grease-based uh, makeup uh, that is basically the birth of the modern uh, stage uh, makeup. And Altman discusses uh, these changes when sometimes the lighting has already changed, but the old uh, makeup techniques are still used, especially in provincial small-town theaters. Uh, and uh, this produces this very unpleasant to him effects, moonlit faces, uh, wax masks, uh, lifeless tone offensive to the eye. Now, uh, I find it difficult to translate into English the distinction between maske and larve, uh, which uh, exists here in German. But uh, I would like to point out that the word, uh, both can be uh, translated as masks, uh, but uh, larve has uh, this connection to the uh, ancient Roman cult of ancestors and their uh, death masks or busts or sculptures. So there is this uh, connection to the dead, and again, the deadness of a badly made up face. But also, wax larve and this wax masks in the German speaking context have a specific reference to carnival. And here are some examples uh, on the left uh, an actual mid 19th century wax mask. Uh, and on the right, mid 20th uh, century, uh, examples from the catalog of a Swiss uh, producer of toys and all kinds of um, items for popular uh, entertainment, Hans uh, Karl uh, And uh, I would like to argue that 
uh, basically uh, these two masks which appear in Altman's text, they create uh, as uh, respectively good and bad masks, uh, create a, and uh, maintain a hierarchy between the classical or perceived as such theatrical tradition um, and this popular theatrical tradition where one is associated with uh, good taste and uh, with uh, this classical high culture and the other obviously with low culture and bad taste. And in fact, uh, these two masks, they also appear, uh, in fact, the references to wax uh, also appear in criticism of women's cosmetics quite often as, for example, uh, in this satire from uh, Punch, uh, satire of uh, Madame Rachel's costly Arabian preparations. Uh, so uh, here, uh, clients of uh, Madame Rachel are uh, compared to ladies in their hairdressers' windows, bright and brilliant with their glass eyes, radiant in red and white wax. Uh, so here also, uh, mention of wax uh, makes this connection to the world of cheap commercialism, this shop windows, hairdressers windows, uh, and also to the world of popular entertainment. We can think of wax museums and particularly their chambers of horror uh, to which a reference to Frankenstein um, clearly uh, points. And also there is uh, this idea of low uh, culture as something associated uh, with um, bad makeup and also in the title of the article we can see this word stucco a synonym of plaster as i said one of the most widespread um, negative descriptions of 19th century women's makeup uh, and my final quote again comes from uh, baroness uh, Stubbs, lady uh, dress ladies dressing room uh, where also after uh, quite many negative comments about uh, women's uh, habits with regard to cosmetics. She says, well, okay, if you must powder your face, some faces do require powdering, but you need to powder very carefully because nothing is so ugly as a face powdered like a pierrot ready to green and to look like a clown ought not to be an object of ambition. Again, we see this reference to popular uh, theater, circus, uh, and such, et cetera, the world of popular uh, entertainment. Uh, so uh, my um, uh, conclusion is uh, that uh, this idea of natural beauty, which pervades 19th century culture, uh, and uh, which was quite a huge pressure on women, because they had to look beautiful, but also they had to look natural. And I think the echoes of these imperatives is something we can still very often feel. But uh, I would also like to point out that this idea of natural beauty uh, is uh, created and maintained in opposition to the unnatural popular taste. And this is where an intersectional approach uh, is uh, very useful as everywhere else, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another another wonderful presentation, and so interesting to hear about differing um, attitudes to makeup. So we will go straight on to our next speaker. So next we have Dr. Sean Bonnell from Manchester Metropolitan University. Sean is a UK-based artist, curator and publisher. Trace, her curation and publishing project, was established in 1999. Artist books published under the imprint Trace Editions include Wild Track, the first book of poetry by Mark Hayworth Booth, Imagine Finding Me by Chino Otsuka and Villa Mona by Marjorie Riley. Since 2014, she has created an annual exhibition of UK graduate photography featuring over 250 images selected from 16 universities. 
So without further ado, I will introduce Sean and her paper, Hiding in Plain Sight, Women Play in Empowerment, Some Ludic Aspects of Masks and Head Coverings. Um, thank you, um, Sophie, should I just, um, I'm trying to find out how to share my screen, just go onto the share screen. Yep, should be right there. Um, uh, there we go. Great, thank you. Is that okay? Um, so, thank you very much for um, inviting me today, and um, and thank you to Ben and Elizabeth and Sophie. Um, uh, okay, throughout this pandemic, I have been increasingly surprised by the large number of people who refuse to wear a mask. What happens to us when we put on a mask? Do we disappear? Is this the fear of the libertarians? Boris Johnson's notorious newspaper article of August 2018 proves that he was clearly threatened by women's facial concealment. And H.G. Wells' Invisible Man experienced similar terror through his own unmasking when the removal of his bandages revealed his complete incorporeality. The clown's face to many is a disturbing thing and it is and has been useful for certain political leaders to encourage amusement within the masses by adopting chemical, physical appearances and behaviours. In uh, not taking them seriously, an insidious purchase can be gained. I'm thinking here, for example, of Hitler's adoption of Charlie Chaplin's moustache, which at the time was not considered a sinister facial adornment. This reminds us that the wearing of a mask is in itself performative. This paper will explore ideas of agency that women demonstrate through the covering of their heads and faces the interaction between the mask and the wearer. Karen Barrad, in discussing agency, introduces this term, interaction. She writes, agency never ends, it can never run out. The notion of interactions reformulates the traditional notions of causality and agency in an ongoing reconfiguring of both the real and the possible. Does the hiding and transforming of one's head cause a sense of empowerment through the very act of disappearing? Is it the case that for women to prove their power and agency, they must appear to disappear? Oh, I can't get my, I can't get, oh. Um, here is an image for a fashion story titled A Women's War, made by the surrealist artist Lee Miller, which was commissioned for Vogue in 1941. This image was considered too controversial at the time for publication, um, with the models posing in an air raid shelter in the garden of a house in Hampstead. The masks worn in this picture were issued to male air raid wardens as protection from incendiary bombs. The photography historian Mark Hayworth Booth says of this image, no other photographer of the phony war and the blitz seems to have produced an image quite like this portrait of the double deformity of war. The power in this image is in the appropriation of everyday masculine protection by a woman. Miller brings her willful, surrealist sensibility to this photograph through her styling of the women in the photograph using lipstick, nail varnish and the air warden's whistle. It is a prime example of willful amateurism. Willful amateurism is a form of serious play derived from the chance and play of Cage and Duchamp, reworked as a feminist 21st century deviation of Dada, surrealism and conceptualism. 
willful amateurism functions within a paradoxical space between sculpture, performance and photography. It is made manifest through lived experience and is fueled by the following characteristics. Play, imagination, dysfunction, irreverence, absurdity, chance and fiction. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, willfulness involves asserting or disp disposed to assert one's own will against persuasion, instruction or command. To be governed by will without regard to reason, to be determined to take one's own way, to be obstinately self-willed or perverse. As a child, to be described as willful was not a compliment. For some, it is a more positive term. Sarah Ahmed in 2010 um, writes, willfulness as audacity, willfulness as standing against, willfulness as creativity. I want to indicate here that willful amateurism, as I understand it, is feminist, but more implied than asserted. It is a contrary signifier. The word amateur defines an unpolished, unskilled or raw accomplishment, as well as a lack of professionalism. There is also the meaning of doing something for the love of it. I am reclaiming this word amateur to describe an attitude or state of mind common to the work of artists who possess this aesthetic I am identifying and the reappropriation of the word amateur in both its meanings, I would argue, is a willful exercise in itself. The following images reveal the playfulness and audacity in women artists and practitioners and activists who might all be described as willful amateurs. The feminist act artist group, activist artist group, the Guerrilla Girls, were formed in 1985, having become incensed by an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art that included 165 artists, of which only 17 were women. They wear guerrilla masks in public, remaining deliberately anonymous to focus on the issues rather than who they might be. Their power resides in their invisibility. Similarly, Pussy Riot, who came to prominence in 2012 when they performed punk prayer in Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Saviour. To disguise their identities, they each wore multicoloured balaclavas. Six years later, they produced merchandise, including, their, um, including calling their clothing line, um, I'm not sure, of Passion Federation. Their online store declared, in the current political situation, where our country has no freedom of speech, clothing became an act of self-expression, a way of showing that we disagree. In February 2017, a pussy hat um, was acquired by the Victoria and Albert Museum collection as part of their rapid response collective activity. What started as a Los Angeles craft community project grew rapidly, gaining global support as people shared the pattern and photos of their hats across social media. The hat quickly became an immediately recognisable expression of female solidarity and symbol of the power of collective action, even featuring on the cover of Time magazine in February 2017. Claude Cahoon was both willful and amateur. She was a prolific artist from around 1915 until her death in 1954. Her work remaining largely hidden, although it did feature occasionally in survey exhibitions on surrealism. Um, but it was not until 1994, 40 years after her death, that she came to prominence when her work was shown in the exhibition Mise en Scene at the ICA in London. In an essay for the accompanying catalogue, David Bates states that her images hit contemporary practice like an arrow through time. Cindy Sherman has most often been described as the natural successor to Cahoon. 
she utilizes makeup and prosthetics to mark her face and body in a practice that also exists in a space of paradox. In her case, that of photography, performance and painting. More recently, a cohort of much younger women have entered this field. Here is Hayley Morris Cafiero with two images from her performance photography series called The Bully Pulpit. Cafiero is seen here transgressing gender, willfully exposing the bullies who trolled her on social media. She says, I photograph myself costumed like the people who've attempted to bully me. Finding photos online, I recreated their images using wigs, clothing and simple prosthetics, while small imperfections mirror the fallacy that the internet will shield their identities. Finally, I overlay the parodies with transcripts of the bullying comments, almost as if I was subtweeting them. I realised that I can, parody, I can parody the bullies' attempts by creating images and publishing them on the internet, the same vehicle used for their attacks, and the images would be seen by millions and would live again, again and again. Juno Calypso featured a fictional character that she called Joyce, Joyce is a woman disenchanted by the laboured construct of femininity. She is portrayed continually testing out beauty treatments and body improvement devices in the desire for perfection. Calypso says, yes, the rituals we invest in as women can be bizarre, but that's not really the problem. The real problem is the way women are considered moronic for wanting to indulge in those things. Stop patronising us. We know what we're doing. All of my work essentially boils down to two things, desire and disappointment. And I like to find humour in the path from one to the other. An important lesson I've learnt is that humour is a powerful tool for women. Uh, these pictures um, of mine were planned as a narrative commencing at the beginning of the dressing process and ending once dressed and ready for any or all work eventuality. I sourced props to act as items of safety gear. I found a white workman's boiler suit, which I prepared by dyeing it pink. The props were all household articles, which acted as items of safety clothing. I chose a black backdrop and floor so that I would inhabit and float inside this black box space. I imagined myself being inside the camera while producing this work. Interestingly, the more covered up I became in the pictures, the more comfortable and relaxed I felt. But this comfort is not reflected in the photographs which grow increasingly sinister and terrifying for the viewer as the sequence builds. Risk assessment was a sister project to health and safety, where I worked to an even stricter set of instructions to assess the risk of a series of household tasks and then completing them, wearing the correct and requisite safety gear for each assignment. My photographs um, which have the appearance of absurdity, are conjured from the most banal of experiences and objects. I work with objects from ordinary everyday life and will them a different existence through the catalyst of the camera. The object through this decontextualization is made useless, art, but only via the conduit of the photograph. I will use whatever is there to hand, and I will work wherever I am. But the other ingredient in this recipe is the imagination. I confront the camera at a time of life when women are expected to disappear. In all of these photographs, I am not there. It is not me I see, but her. I am the found object, 
the ready-made for these pictures. They are as much about this performance space as the figures depicted within it. A fusing of sculpture, performance and photography, which constitutes what I think of as theatre or photo theatre. I understand that in these images, the figure becomes object with all the objects themselves acting. In other words, an interaction. In the hiding of our faces, women can laugh and cock a snook at the patriarchy in plain sight. Thank you. Thanks, wonderful. And thank you so much to all of our speakers. I think there's a lot of links between all all three of the papers we've heard, I've written down um, things about appearing and disappearing, visibility and invisibility, and self and other, they were themes that I thought went throughout all of the papers. Um, so oh, I'll check the chat to see if there's any questions. Lots of lovely comments in the chat. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can only see a selection of can't see all the hands. I don't see any hands. So I will ask a question then. And it will be for, I suppose it will be for each person, really. I really liked uh, Sean's concept of agency and um, empowerment and disempowerment. So I wondered if each of the speakers could speak a little more about agency empowerment and disempowerment um, with their topics and, and we'll start with Colleen. Sure well there's a lot that I wasn't able to get into in this talk of course and um, one of the things that really intrigues me about Margiela's masks is that a lot of people have written the same kind of thing about them and as I hope I pointed out they tend to be these assumptions or sort of exaggerations of what the masks were. But one of the things that strikes me as far as agency is perhaps his masking of models in the early days may have also had to do with uh, the model's comfort level. If they were not in fact professional models, but they wanted to be part of this interesting thing, perhaps the masking gave them the sense of agency that they could do this fun, interesting, engaging thing but also uh, not necessarily be identified or have it define them. So that's one of the things that comes to mind particularly when speaking about uh, was there a misogynistic overtone to this. I'm not saying there's not, it's not my personal opinion that there was, but uh, that's just one of the many factors or interpretations I think you could bring into this. Great, thanks. And Christina? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. For my research, this is absolutely central. Uh, and it's interesting that today we have mentioned uh, masculine suffragettes uh, quite a few times. So I think that, in fact, um, well, also we have these stereotypes about uh, feminine women uh, and passive. Uh, on the one hand, uh, as far as 19th, early 20th century is concerned, and on the other hand, uh, men and masculine women who uh, somehow tried to get their share of political presence, etc. But uh, what interests me is how fashion and uh, cosmetics, dress broadly, uh, was used by women uh, to actually uh, assert their power and their presence. And we can think about crinolines, how quite literally women took that space which they had uh, uh, never taken before uh, and this was also remarked on uh, satirically and derided but it was uh, a way of creating presence as well uh, and also uh, concerning makeup uh, we can see it as uh, a way of uh, actually um, creating this surface uh, this opaque surface for the observer who cannot 
uh, violate your uh, privacy or investigate your inner world as they perhaps would like. Uh, so for me, this is definitely a very central uh, issue, women's agency and how it can, how they are not uh, only, they were not and are not these passive victims of fashion, as they are very often presented in popular uh, discourse, uh, but uh, how they could uh, navigate uh, consumption and uh, visual culture to, to create um, their uh, own uh, images and some kind of uh, visual statements, perhaps. Lovely. And, and Sean? Um, I was, yes, I've been thinking about this. Um, I, I, I think that um, women have agency, more agency, when they're hidden and when they're invisible. I've, I'm finding this out as I get older, in that, um, you know, as I get more grey, um, I'm more invisible and, um, and the more I can misbehave and uh in public almost you know um so what i'm thinking of it like the uh harry potter invisibility cloak you know there's there's a sort of agency in being able to do things when you cannot be seen and um and i think that's what um i think that's the sort of thing that um really exercised boris johnson when he um, was writing about um the women wearing burqas um, so if we think about it that women in a way have to fight um, in society um, to be visual, uh, they have to sort of behave like men almost, like you know, Margaret Thatcher, think of her very masculine approach to things. Um, so whereas if we accept our invisibility, we have more agency, we have more, we have more power. To disrupt. Yeah, great. I feel that um, certainly with wearing masks, that I feel more invisible and therefore safer and more comfortable. And so I actually quite like wearing a mask in public because I don't feel as as seen as usual. Which is funny because if you're wearing like bring this out again a bright <laughs> mask, maybe people are looking at you more, um, but you don't feel as looked at. So I think that's really interesting point about feeling visible or invisible especially as a woman oh i can see andrew has his hand up for a question go ahead thank you i I'm, i suppose it was more an observation thinking about margella colleen and thinking about question of agencies because it's always struck me as interesting that you know there's lots of masking that goes on throughout all the shows but he himself was you know i think i've only seen two photographs of himself uh in public and that idea of well there was a control there wasn't there because he was always backstage he was always visible that he could have been photographed those photographs could have been published yet somehow he he made that control and i wondered that thing about agency he didn't need to wear a mask because his power allowed him to make that happen and i just wondered whether you had any thoughts on that at all oh absolutely i think you're right um what I found very interesting was that, in fact, women's wear daily, which I've mentioned a couple of times, um, not surprisingly, had a really keen interest in Margiela. And so I ended up going through every issue that mentioned him, because it's, it's digitized, which is really helpful, um, every issue that mentioned him during the 90s. And they actually had a number of photographs of him. At first, I would get really excited, and then I was less and less excited as time went on. So um, you are absolutely correct in that, in a general sense, he kept his identity somewhat hidden. I didn't know a lot about his personal life until that recent film, which I found really fascinating. But of course, you don't see his face, you see his hands. Um, but even his demeanor and his personality was incredibly different than what I had expected. And I think that's really fascinating that, you know, you read these faxes that he would send to people and they were brusque and vague and strange. And then in this movie, he's this really warm, lovely, articulate person. Um, so there is a lot of that, but I think in a general sense, 
uh, the fact that Margiela was unknown, obviously he was known to a lot of people. He had a lot of people working for him. He had a lot of people who knew him in the industry. So I think some of it's mythologized and some of it's true. But I think certainly that the way he projected that he was not interested in stardom did turn some people off, or I should say some people responded to that and respected that in a way that other designers haven't been able to manage. If that makes sense. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I can see in the chat, uh, Fiona has put about backstage and front stage from Goffman being relevant and the interplay between the two. So perhaps um, the panelists could comment on on that interplay between backstage and front stage and if it came into their work or how it relates to their work. And we can, um, we'll start with Sean this time. We'll go backwards around. Um, I think it does relate. I, I have to, I have to um, confess I haven't read Goffman, so I don't know um, where this comes from, but um, definitely um, the interrelation between the backstage and the front stage is, um, is very, key to my thinking anyway. Well, um, perhaps not so much with regard to 19th century, though um, concerning the material I've been presenting today, um, I think this um, interplay between theatrical world and the real world and how makeup and these debates around makeup, whether it is acceptable for women or not, uh, actually point to the theatricality of social interactions. Uh, so this has very much to do uh, with what uh, Goffman wrote about. This is uh, really about you know, everyday life as a theater. Uh, but uh, I'm really uh, intrigued by this concept with regard to what's happening nowadays uh, on the Instagram, for example, uh, and uh, overall how we are, yeah, as uh, Fiona uh, uh, mentions uh, this uh, backstage, we could read it as becoming front stage because there is this huge interest um, vis-a-vis fashion shows, like what's going on backstage rather than, even more than the runway actually, and also, we are interested in what, what's going on behind uh, the scenes. Uh, so we can see this concept of backstage and front stage uh, constantly redefined. And what used to be behind the scenes uh, actually is put on display and is somehow staged also. And backstage, the real backstage, the Goffmanian backstage moves somewhere uh, further away. So I think this is a really interesting topic to just uh, I too am not terribly familiar with um, Goffman's work, but I'm glad this came up because I do think in a sort of literal sense, it does relate a lot to Margiela's work. Um, one of the things that I find both fascinating and frustrating when researching Margiela is that it's very difficult to discern between the two. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of photographs of his runway shows um, and they're confusing in, in many ways. And there have been a couple of really good publications over the past decade or so that have helped a lot with that. Um, but one of the concerns is that there was often not a lot of difference. Um, one of his most famous shows from 1989 for the spring 1990 presentation was shown in this far flung part of Paris um, that was literally on this abandoned playground. People were climbing over walls to get in. Um, so there's no backstage front stage. There's no seating. You know, these were really a free for all. Um, another example is uh, an, uh, runway show he showed a couple of years later at a Salvation Army where people were sitting on, you know, old washing machines to watch these shows. So there's a real breakdown between front stage and backstage in his work. But when it came to trying to figure out which collections had masks or veiling of some sort, it's kind of challenging because 
backstage, if there was a backstage, the models are often not wearing the masks. And on the runway, if you can discern what the runway was, they are. And then sometimes, as I mentioned, they would wear the masks on the runway and then remove them at the end of the presentation and come back out maskless. Um, so it's a really kind of challenging thing to discern, but um, I think in general, that was sort of Margiela's point with his entire existence and aesthetic. So interesting about, yeah, the merging of backstage and front stage and that interplay between both in, in all of your work. Um, I'll just check the chat for any more questions. Um, Elizabeth has dropped some references in for everyone to see, um, some Goffman and some masks and emasculation. Um, so I think if there are no other questions, sorry, I've turned my camera off because I've had to plug in my laptop and um, it's really dark in, in my flat. But if there's no other questions, I can hand back over to Elizabeth or Ben to continue and close today. Fantastic. Thank you so much, 